We now go to the next generation of models uh, for fixed income markets and bonds. Uh, these are models of forward rates. This came in the late 80s, early 90s, the first of those models. We already defined uh, forward rates before, but now we are going to model them as uh, random processes uh, moving in time. Let's see how that goes. First, I need to define something called instantaneous forward rate, uh, and it's going to be based on the usual, uh, usual notion of the forward rate in discrete time, but then we will take limits when time becomes smaller and smaller. The idea for the forward rate, in uh, continuously compounded forward rate, is the following. Uh, think about the following investment. So we want to see what the rate is corresponding to investing $1 at the future time, capital C, S, and then uh, hold, and then having the dollar grow at some forward rate until the time, capital T. Okay? So we are sitting today at time, small t. And then we want to invest one dollar at S and see how much it will grow up to time capital T. The way to do that is to sell short one S bond, zero coupon bond with maturity S, uh, paying one dollar at maturity S. Uh, if we sell it short, we can buy for that amount a certain number of T bonds, bonds with maturity T. How many? Well, if we get P of T S for the S bond, that's the price of the S bond, we can buy P of T S over P of T T T bonds. Right? If you get two dollars for this one and this one costs one dollar, we can buy two of those. Alright, and then at time S, since we are short the S bond, we have to pay one dollar to deliver the bond payoff. And uh, Finally, at time capital T, since we have P of T S over P of T T T bonds, uh, we get uh, that many dollars at time capital T. Right? So this is exactly the way that there is zero investment today at small t. There is uh, investment of one dollar at time S, and then you get something at time T. This ratio. Okay, so one dollar goes to this ratio at time T. In between, from S to T, there is some rate. If we think of it as continuously compounded, uh, then it 1 times E to the that rate times T minus S has to be equal what you get at time T. Okay, This is denoted R of small t, capital S, capital T. And that's uh, the forward rate between time S and time capital T. If we compute it, if we take logs to get rid of the exponential function, it is equal to minus log of the bond with higher maturity minus log the bond of the with the lower maturity over t minus s. But now it turns out to be more convenient to model so-called instantaneous forward rate, meaning I'm going to let t minus s go to zero. I'm going to let s get close to t take the limits when S and T uh, get together. Uh, so thinking about forward rate during a very, very infinitesimally short uh, time in the future. If you do that, well, see what you get here. I, I am dividing this difference in logs by the, these arguments. It's going to be the de derivative, mathematical derivative of the log with respect to derivative with respect to the maturity, right? Because I'm changing maturity here. Okay, so instantaneous forward rate is defined as the this limit of this when s goes to t, and that limit is exactly minus the derivative of the log of the bond price, but the derivative with respect to maturity. Okay? Today is fixed. What we are uh, differentiating uh, with respect to is the ma is the maturity. Fine. And uh, if I write this a bit differently, if I integrate and then get rid of the log by taking exponentials, this is the same as saying that the bond price is equal to e to the minus integral from t to capital T, FTU, integrated over the maturity, FTU, DU. Okay? 
these two equations are equivalent, uh, you can just take a derivative of this one to see that you get this one after <coughs> taking logs. Uh, actually, first take logs and then take the derivative, you will see that you get this one. Right? So this is the uh, these are the relationship, how to get from bond prices the forward rates, instantaneous forward rates, and how to get from forward rates, how to get bond prices. Okay, another uh, remark that I will need uh, later, uh, the instantaneous forward rate for the immediate time in the future, uh, the time in the future is actu actually today, that's just a short rate. Okay? That can be seen uh, by, uh, by remembering, well, I'll go to the next slide, uh, by remembering that uh, the bond price can also be written like this. Okay, and if you if you take uh, <coughs> the uh, log and derivative, uh, you will uh, you and you put capital T equal to small t, you will get uh, that claim from the previous slide that f at small t small t is short rate R of t. Now I'll let let you look at that if you want to. Otherwise, we'll just take this as given. Okay. But it comes from it comes from these two relationships and the <coughs> taking derivatives and logs. Okay, so we have now the the eighties and even seventies. If you if you take into account Fasecek, uh, the, the, the this was the first equation was the modeling. Uh, paradigm. Uh, this is how you model the bond prices by modeling the short rate and computing expected values. Now, Heath, Gerald, Morton in the early 90s, or late 80s, they said, well, mm, let's not model the short rate, let's model the forward rate, where forward rate is a stochastic process which depends on today's time and maturity, and it's related to the bond price through this relation here. The bond price is e to the minus integral forward rate du, where u is the maturity. Why? Why did they? Why did they want to do that? Well, look, I told you that the short rate really is not something which is observable. Right? If you know the bond prices, you can't really directly know what the short rate is because there is an expectation here operator so you cannot recover the short rate uh, short rate directly from bond prices however you can recover the the forward rates directly from the bond prices at least if you observe bond prices for all maturities which in practice is not true but uh, you know in practice uh, again you you observe the yield curve, meaning the bond prices only for certain uh, for certain points. So if you look at the yield curve, which is equivalent to looking at bond prices, you get something like this. As, as, I, as I said before, you you interpolate, extrapolate, smooth it out. So you pretend you are observing bond prices with all maturities, and once you have that, then you can recover the the forward rates simply from the formula that. Uh, that is given here. The forward rates are uh, this uh, minus derivative of the log of the bond prices. Right? So that's the difference uh, relative to the short rate. Uh, we can directly observe the forward rates, at least assuming we see all the mature bond prices with all maturities, which we could not do with the short rate. And Heath, Gerald, Morton said, let's then model the forward rates. This is really like, really like modeling the yield curve. Because from the yield curve, we can recover the forward rates, so, uh, or other way around. So let's model the forward rates. And we will see that this is also useful for calibration purposes, exactly because we can directly recover uh, the forward rates uh, from the bond prices. Uh, David Heath was a professor uh, of operations research at Cornell, later of mathematical finance at Carnegie Mellon. Um, he died a few years ago, uh, 
Robert Jero is a professor of finance at Cornell. Uh, Morton was their student, later was a quant on Wall Street. And so they, they suggested this, and uh, so I'm going to call it an, the AJM model, or Heath, Jero, Morton model. It's not really a, m a model, it's a family of models, it's an approach. And they said, let's model the forward rates as a diffusion process, as a Brownian motion type uh, process, where uh, the drift is some function alpha of, uh, of uh, current time and maturity, dt, plus uh, volatility, again, a function of time and maturity, dwt. That's that was the next generation of models. It's still uh, basically in continuous time without jumps. It's still kind of the most general model um, that uh, you could work with. And um, it's actually more natural than the short rate models for introducing uh, more than one factor. And this is this notation here. I'm using sigma tr for sigma transposed in case sigma is a vector, uh, in which case uh, brown in motion w would also be a vector. So this, in general, what I mean by this is really inner product of two vectors, meaning it's a summation over i, sigma i, t, t, w, d, w, d, w, i, o, t. Okay, so you you could uh, have more than one Brownian motion here, and then also more than one volatility. So vector of volatilities and vector of Brownian motions. So this notation here, sigma transpose dw, that's just a vector notation. It really means the summation sigma i dwi. Uh, why is it more natural here to have more than one factor? Because there are many forward rates. Eh? There are there are forward rates for different maturities. So you could just think of forward rates for different maturities as being different factors. Um, with a short rate, it, it, the short rate doesn't depend on the maturity, so it's by its nature it's kind of a one-dimensional one uh, object, one factor. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, uh, modeling approach that Heath, uh, Jero, and Morton suggested. Now, that's fine. So in principle, we have to choose alpha and sigma, then we have our model. But remember, this is all under the pricing probability. Right? This is under the pricing probability. Uh, and the uh, question is, uh, um, can we choose alpha and sigma in any possible way for our model and still have no arbitrage? Can we do that? The answer is no. Under pricing probability, you don't have complete flexibility to choose alpha and sigma. Uh, there might be arbitrage if you choose them uh, without, uh, uh, without thinking about it. P for example, right in the black scholes merton model, we know that the stock price under the pricing probability has to have the drift r dt plus sigma dw and the s over s. Okay, you could not. We could not choose mu in any possible drift in any possible way under pricing probability. It had to be r. Okay, something similar will happen here. Uh, you cannot choose alpha any way you want. Uh, it will be. It will have a special value. You, we will be able to choose sigma any way we want, but not alpha. Once we choose sigma, alpha will be determined. Okay, and uh, how how do we do that? How do we uh, prevent arbitrage? Well, we have to make sure that the discounted bond prices are martingales. Like here, the discounted stock price had to be a martingale under the pricing probability. Right, so this was under Q here, but uh, I'm not writing Qs. Okay, 